So, you walk around the city, drinking your coffee, and a strange girl approaches you and hugs you. Hi, Mike! That's where you are! Ready to go? Wait, what? Firstly, your name's James. Secondly, you weren't going anywhere, you were just having a casual walk. And lastly, you have no idea who this girl is. Uh, sorry, I don't know you. You must have taken me for someone else, you say thinking she's a weirdo and backing away. No, no, no! Wrong, negative, rewind. You shouldn't have said that. Maybe she fully realizes that you don't know each other, but still approached you for some reason. Well, apart from you having kind eyes and a gorgeous smile, of course. What if this girl is in danger, and this is her cry for help? Okay, let me cheat a little bit and show you what might have happened to her. Suppose this girl is Riley. She's 19 years old. An hour ago, just like you, she walked out of her house in a very good mood. She went for a walk, and in a couple of hours, she was to meet her friends. While standing in line for an ice cream, she noticed that some man was staring at her from around the corner. He was wearing black shaggy pants, a black hoodie, and sunglasses. Even though it's hard to recognize a person dressed like that, She was pretty sure she'd never seen him before, and he looked suspicious. If you ever find yourself in a similar situation, remember rule number one, trust your gut. If you're feeling uncomfortable, don't take any risks. Yeah, we all stare at people from time to time, but it's better to watch out and be careful. Rule number two, go to a safe place. It's better to avoid dark and empty streets, of course. You better go pick a well-lit and crowded street or store, even if it's in the opposite direction from where you are actually going. Make sure to stay as close to people as possible. Check if the person is following you. If they are, then rule number three, do not go home. You don't want that stalker to know your address, right? Keep walking around the city and better choose the most crowded and most illogical routes. Stop to get a coffee, do some shopping, go to the post office. It's the right time to do all the unfinished business you might have. Maybe the person will get tired of following you and head home. If you want to confirm your suspicions, try this. First, make several irrational turns. For example, walk around some building. It's unlikely that a person who's minding their own business will make circles too. Another way is to change the pace and see if the person adjusts their pace to yours. Or you can enter a store, walk out of it, and then come back inside. If that person returns too, you are being followed. But don't panic. Rule number four, be prepared. Make sure you have something to fight back. For example, grab the keys and keep them in your hand. Type the emergency phone number on your cell phone in advance to call without losing a second if need be. During a call, name your address first. Only then should you say who you are and what happened. In case you can't finish the phone call, at least they'll know where to search. If you're in danger and need help, don't be afraid to make a scene. Fight and shout. Try to get everyone's attention. It might scare off the stalker. But remember, when you ask for help, always address a particular person, looking them in the eye. If you just cry, everyone will keep minding their own business, thinking someone else will help you. If you single out someone from the crowd, the person will feel responsible and will be more likely to help. Well, back to our Riley. She noticed the guy was watching her, so she walked around the city, trying to get rid of him. But it didn't work. The man was still after her. This didn't look good. She called her parents and friends, but no one picked up. She still had an hour before the meeting with her friends, and she couldn't just circle around like that. Only one trick was left before she had to make a drama in the middle of the street. When none of your friends are around, and they can't make it to meet you, you just have to pretend like they are around. You can approach some stranger, well, someone who looks nice and kind, and pretend you know them. Hopefully, they'll play along. The stalker will see you're not alone and, most probably, leave for good. So, Riley took a deep breath and started to look in the crowd, trying to find someone who seemed nice. 
out of all people, she picked you. With her heart skipping a beat, she ran towards you and hugged you. Hey, Mike, that's where you are. Ready to go? Here's where your part comes in. Play along, nod, smile, hug her back, and don't give away your surprise. Remember, somebody might be stalking her, so you have to look real. Your first action should be to continue talking to her like you know each other. Say something casual like, oh, hey kiddo, how are you? And start walking with her, keeping up the conversation. Pay attention to the girl's behavior. She might look nervous and scared, her voice might tremble, or her hands might be shaking. Keep being friendly to calm her down and let her know you have her back. While talking, try to discreetly find out what it's all about. But be careful and don't look around just like that, trying to spot any suspicious types. If there's someone still following the girl, they can see you know about them. Tell the girl you wanted to show her new photos of your cat. Take out your cell phone, type, are you in danger, and show her the screen. If the girl nods, go to the next step. Don't leave her alone. Keep walking, talking to her, and try to take some discreet looks around to spot the things or people that seem odd. When you spot the stalker, try to remember as many details about them as possible. What they wear, if there are any accessories, what their skin color, hair color, height, and build are. But don't look straight at them yet. Use any possibility to study them like the reflections in shop windows, mirrors, or turning your head before crossing the road. Probably, when the stalker notices that the girl is not alone and will have the company for a long time, they'll get lost. So keep going, paying attention if they're still after you. If it's already been quite a while and they don't disappear, it's time to let them know you know you're being followed. Stop, turn around, and look them straight in the eye. Be confident and show them that you know about them and want them to get lost. Use this face-to-face opportunity to spot as many notable features of theirs as possible, so you can later describe them in every minor detail. When they leave, don't leave the girl alone just yet. Walk around for a while to make sure the stalker really is gone. After that, it's better to walk the girl home or wherever she was going, to make sure she is safe and nothing else threatens her. Congratulations, you're the hero of the day. Not everyone knows this trick, so you can even initiate it yourself. Wherever you are, there might be someone you might save with just a casual talk. If you are, for example, in a subway and see that some suspicious guy is hassling a girl and she doesn't feel comfortable about it, just step up. Approach her, say you haven't seen her in a while, and start a casual talk like you were her old friend. The guy will just drift away from her, and the girl will probably be beyond grateful for your help. Stay with her and talk until she's safe. Welcome back to Science and You. As you're walking in the wild, a snake appears from some dry bushes and bites you above your ankle. How rather unfortunate! Keep calm. You must keep your heart rate and blood pressure low to slow down the spread of the venom. Remove your shoes and socks. Now you must find out whether the bite came from a venomous or non-venomous snake. If you see two deep puncture wounds on your leg, they came from the venomous fellow's fangs. In a non-venomous serpent's bite, you'll see small sharp teeth in a U-shape. There are around 600 venomous snake species, and you should look out for vipers and cobras. Each has a different type of venom and needs different treatments. If a viper bites you, don't put pressure on your wound. Trapping the venom in one area could make the tissue damage worse. Then you must rush to the nearest hospital for treatment. If a cobra bites someone, you must tie the area with a bandage to stop the venom from going further into their system. Keep an eye on the fellow that was bitten to make sure they're breathing. Yes, cobra venom can paralyze the diaphragm. Don't suck out the venom. It travels so fast into someone's system, you'll achieve nothing. Take a good look at the snake, and if you can, snap a few photos of it to show the medical staff. Try to have good picture composition. Moving on from snakes to allergies, 
Most people respond to allergens with a runny nose or some sneezing, but others have far more complicated responses. An itchy rash may be a sign of an allergic reaction. It might look like dermatitis, and it can show up a week after your exposure to an allergen. There was a rare case a few years ago. Someone got braces for the first time, and after a week, they developed an itchy rash under their wristwatch and stomach. As it turned out, they were allergic to the nickel in braces. If you get blisters on your skin after sitting in the sun for one to two hours, it's probably not sunburn, but an allergic reaction. You may also have some skin redness, tiny raised bumps, and scaling. When that happens, go to the emergency room fast. Experts will run tests and give you advice on how to continue from there. Sometimes different medications might cause it too, or fruits such as limes and parsnips can. If you're allergic to pollen, stay away from fruits and veggies. Some of them have proteins like the ones found in pollen, and your immune system responds to it as real pollen. They can trigger the same allergy symptoms such as itchiness, swelling of the mouth, face, and, well, you know the gist. You're trapped in a car during a winter storm. Outside it's freezing, and you begin to shiver. That's a good thing. When temperatures drop below a comfortable level, your body starts to shake. This action boosts your body's surface heat production by 500%. But shivering can only warm you up for so long. After a while, your muscles will run out of fuel and they'll stop contracting. If someone suddenly stops shaking and they grow tired and want to fall asleep, act fast. Bring them indoors, remove any wet clothes, rub their hands and feet, wrap them in blankets, and find warm, dry compresses to apply to their chest, neck, or lower tummy. Never put a warm compress on their arms or legs. The sudden heat will force cold blood back to the heart, brains, and lungs, causing the body's core temperature to drop. While you're driving down an empty road, you hear an emergency radio broadcast about the weather. A tornado watch in your area means that a tornado is likely to happen. But a tornado warning means a tornado has appeared on the radar or has been spotted in person. You should also be on the lookout for hail. It appears when updrafts within a thunderstorm push the rain into the thick clouds and it freezes. But when a tornado is approaching, hail can arrive without rain. Then everything gets quiet. The air becomes still and there's no wind. Suddenly, you'll see the clouds moving quickly in a rotating pattern or toward the sky. You'll hear a loud waterfall sound that will turn into a roar as the tornado gets close. It'll be similar to the sound of trains and jets. Debris will begin to fall, and a funnel-shaped cloud will start to rotate, pulling branches and leaves upwards. If the tornado is not moving to either the left or the right, it might be coming toward you, and you won't realize it until it's too close. Take shelter! Just as you're chilling at home watching TV, you hear an eerie whooshing noise. It sounds like a soft gush of wind, but you confirm there's nothing there after checking all the doors. The next day, you feel pressure in your chest, and it gets worse as the week progresses. The chest pains follow with a dreaded feeling of exhaustion. You can't help but think there's something wrong with your body. But the problems are within your house. You might have carbon monoxide poisoning. When this gas fills your home, it builds up in your bloodstream and it replaces the oxygen in your body. Poisoning can also cause headaches, nausea, and confusion. In those cases, run outside to get fresh air and call emergency service. Also, get a carbon monoxide detector and add it in the hallway or areas where you sleep. Check the batteries twice a year, and when the alarm goes off, step outside and you know who to call. You go ice skating. The ice on the lake seems thicker than it was, and uh-oh, you hear a cracking snap, and you end up in the icy water. 
First, your body will go into shock because of the sudden change in temperature. Don't worry, it will pass after one to three minutes. Now, you must find a solid piece of ice and hold on to it. Don't try to climb it. Just put your arms on it, kick your legs, and push the piece forward. It will help you drag your body onto the ice. Once you're on an ice sheet, don't stand up. If you do, your body weight will concentrate on the smaller ice area and it'll break again. Just keep rolling until you're further on the stable ground. What if you have to break the window of a hot car? Car windows have layers of materials that can resist force. Here's what you need to do. Avoid the back windows or the front windshield of the car. They're harder to break. Go for the passenger and driver's side windows. If you've got a hammer, don't hit the glass in the middle. Aim for the edges where the glass breaks easily. Now, if the windows refuse to break with a hammer, screwdriver, or whatever you've got around, look for a small pointy rock. If that doesn't work either, then your best bet is your car's spark plug. Pop your hood, pull out the spark plug, break the porcelain casing, and throw the broken ceramic piece anywhere at the window. It's the middle of summer, and you're vacationing somewhere on the Pacific Rim. Suddenly, you feel a strong quake. Well, this could be the first warning sign of an approaching tsunami. Or it could trigger large waves thousands of miles across. But there are other telltale signs that a tsunami is approaching. One is a change in water levels, either rising or falling. If you see the ocean withdrawing quickly and the seabed getting exposed, you should run at least 100 feet above sea level and one mile inland. Many experts say once the seawater starts receding, you've got five minutes to evacuate before the enormous wave hits. Remember, it's all about science and you. Yep, moving objects through a door when it keeps closing is super annoying. So instead, tie a rubber band around the handle on each side of the door so that it crosses over the latch. The latch then won't be able to pop out, and the door won't lock shut. To check whether your bed sheets are fully dried, take a mirror and place it underneath. Leave it there for around 5 minutes, and if it steams up, it means the sheets are still damp. A damp bed can be a breeding ground for mold and other nasty fungi. You can paint the end of your keys with different colored nail polish so that you can easily identify which key is which. In order to pour the perfect amount of oil or salad dressing, poke holes in the foil seal rather than removing it completely. This prevents a big amount rushing out quickly. To prevent band-aids from slipping off your finger, cut a line on either side. This will create four smaller sticky strips rather than one large one, and it will be much easier to secure. If you enter a public restroom and see a red solo cup someone put under the seat, better choose another booth. It means there's no toilet paper in this one. The red cup is a frequent replacement for a toilet paper hub, which is also put under the seat for the same reason. Speaking of restrooms, almost any public toilet has a large gap between the floor and the door. The reason for such a zero privacy thing is to actually minimize the level of privacy and comfort so that people won't stay there long and there'd be no lines. It's also to clean and safer if some emergency occurs. Forgot to put your drink in the fridge? Wrap a wet paper towel around it and put it in the freezer. In just 15 minutes, your drink will be ice cold. Instead of filling your purse or wallet with store loyalty cards, you can take a photo of them. Just take one snap of the barcode, as well as a picture of the front so you know which card it is. Then, when you visit the store, just scan the barcode on your phone to collect your points. If you're using your phone to watch something and are tired of propping it up and having it fall back down, try using your sunglasses. Simply place them upside down and use the parts that go around your ears to hold the phone in place. Now, if you don't have the correct size coin to put in your shopping cart next time you go to the supermarket, you can use your key instead. 
If you have a key with a rounded end, you can insert that where the coin would go and the cart should unlock. If you're struggling to get your taco shells to stay in place, use a muffin tray. Flip the tray upside down, spray it with oil, and place your tortillas in the gap. Cook them for around 10 minutes at 700 degrees Fahrenheit for the perfect crispy taco shell. You can use a water bottle to separate egg yolks. Hold the bottle over the yolk and squeeze it to suck the yolk up. Drop it into a separate bowl and you're good to go. Next time you're struggling to clean your ceiling fan, use a pillowcase. Slide the pillowcase over each blade to wipe off the dust. This way, excess dust is caught inside the pillowcase and won't rain down on you. To properly clean your blender, fill it with soap and hot water. Switch it on for around 10 seconds and let the swirling water do the hard work. Then just rinse it off and it's clean. Put down a strip of masking tape before nailing into plaster walls. The tape should stop the plaster from flaking or spreading dust all over the floor. If your shoes smell bad, put a few dry tea bags into the shoe. The tea bags will absorb the smell. Try using toothpaste to remove small scratches on furniture. Rub a peanut size amount on the scratch in a circular motion until the scratch buffs out. Then wipe it with a damp cloth and voila! Drill a couple of small holes in the bottom of your trash can to stop the bag getting stuck when you pull it out. The holes stop the vacuum like effect that keeps the bag pinned down. You can easily remove the sticky residue from jars using cooking oil. Soak a cotton pad in some oil, then rub it on the sticky area. Allow it to sit for a few minutes, then it should wipe away easily. Now, you can use hair conditioner to make that new wool sweater less itchy. Just soak it in lukewarm water with a couple of tablespoons of conditioner and leave it for 15 minutes. Then just dry it and your sweater will be much softer. An odor on your fingers can be removed with some minty toothpaste. Rub them together with toothpaste, then rinse them clean. It'll help get rid of the odor and act as a light scrub, too. Now, before you throw out those old sneakers, arm yourself with an old toothbrush and a little toothpaste. Work the paste into the dirty spots and leave it for at least 10 minutes. Wipe it off with a damp cloth and repeat if it didn't do it right the first time. Be careful with color toothpaste, it may leave stains. Washing your clothes on a low heat, or even better, a cold wash, will make them last twice as long. Drying them on the line, if possible, will also make the material last longer than if you used a dryer. Metal zippers are very durable, but they'll snag more than other kinds of zippers. Just gently rub a bar of soap over the teeth of both sides of the zipper. The residue will help lubricate it, making it easier to slide open and closed. When you can't squeeze any more toothpaste out of your tube, just cut the end off. This will allow you to get what's left inside onto your toothbrush in a pinch. If there's enough for more than one use, place it in a plastic bag for later. Freezing candles before use can make them burn a lot slower. This will cool the wax right down and extend its melting time. A pack of cotton pads has those strings on it so that we can hang it on some hook or holder. And no, there's no need to untighten and tighten the pack again. Look at the bottom of the pack. It has a perforated line. Tear along it, and now you're good to pull out a cotton pad. If you've ever tasted a Nintendo cartridge, you'll confirm that, yes, they taste revolting, leaving a sour, bitterish aftertaste in your mouth. They're covered with denatonium benzoate, one of the most disgusting flavors known. Actually, this taste is kind of a hidden function. It prevents people from swallowing those cartridges. Headrests in a car are about comfort, and detachable headrests are about safety. If you pull the headrest out of the seat, you'll see two bars, which are quite sturdy. If you ever get locked or trapped in a car, you can get out of there smashing the window with these bars. Rough edges on the dimes are just about design. The coins used to be made of precious metals to show their real value. People would shave off the edges, spending the shaven coins with the same value, and melt the edges to new coins. To avoid it, minters added that pattern so people could tell if someone cut that coin before. 
That black grate on a microwave isn't just some fancy decoration. It's called a Faraday shield, and it prevents the rays from escaping the microwave. It also speeds up the heating, so you could enjoy yesterday's leftovers faster. A triple handle on a jerry can is there to make it easier for two people to carry it and distribute the fuel evenly. Gas cans often have a second hole that actually needs to be uncapped, too, before you pour the gas. The air passage will prevent it from pouring out, so no more fuel waste. Road trip! You and your best friends are rushing down the highway. Suddenly, one turns off the AC and puts the windows down. No! They wanted to help you cut some gas costs and just made one of the classic mistakes. Turning off the AC and opting for a natural breeze helps while you're stuck in traffic. While you're driving with your windows down on a highway, you're creating unnecessary wind resistance. Your car now needs more energy to move forward, and you end up burning more fuel per ride. While you're struggling through traffic inside the city limits, though, turning off the AC isn't a bad idea. It might not be the most comfortable ride on a hot day, but you're here to save some money, right? Now, a quick common sense test. You have two routes to choose from. One is shorter and another looks longer on the map. What's it gonna be? Common sense is screaming. The first one, duh. But in fact, the shortest route isn't always the best choice in terms of gas usage. You gotta pick the one with the least stop signs, traffic lights, and traffic jams. This route will require less speeding up and slowing down, both major gas eaters. So plan your route wisely. You can consult apps that show real-time traffic data or interactive maps with stoplights. Do you also have a bag of sand, your old inflatable bed, a pair of shoes, and five water canisters in your trunk? Or is it just me? Well, you gotta declutter if you wanna save some cash. Losing 100 pounds that you carry around in your vehicle will decrease your gas usage by up to 1% per gallon relative to your vehicle's weight. More weight means more fuel used. That's some simple traffic math. Brake and accelerate less. Driving at a steady speed above 50 miles per hour helps you save some gas costs. Every time you hit the brakes or take off at a rocket speed at the stoplights, you're making your engine work hard, and it feeds on fuel, you know. Plus, aggressive driving is bad traffic etiquette. So speed up slowly and coast to a braking stop smoothly. Don't go zero to 60 or floor the car until you have to brake abruptly. Cruise control can help you with that drive calmly and steadily when you're on flat terrain like the highway. Once you approach some hills or mountains, cruise control will make your car eat too much gas for no good reason. So turn it off and let the speed go down a bit as you ascend. And then slowly speed up as you go down. This will take some workload off your engine. Park your vehicle a couple of blocks away from your destination. The next time you make the seventh trip driving around the block searching for a parking spot, it will make all perfect sense. When you sum up the frustration, your time spent on those searches, and of course, extra gas costs, you'll be okay settling somewhat further from a busy shopping area, business center, or your favorite popular restaurant. Don't wait until the last minute to refill your tank. Make it a habit to do it once it's three quarters empty, or whenever is more comfortable for you. This way, you won't have to frantically stop at the gas station nearest to you when it's time to refill. Instead, you'll have your time for some research. There are special gas-finding apps to help you find the best deal in your area. Sometimes, it can be across the state or region border, and it's never ever by the highway. Once you're ready to settle down with one gas brand, don't hesitate to ask for something in return. Sign up for their loyalty program, save an app, get a card, whatever it takes to get a discount, cash back, extra points, and other perks from them. Some grocery stores partner up with gas chains, letting you use the points you earn at the store to get a discount on gas. Even 5 cents per gallon can make a difference, so inquire about those. Hybrid vehicle owners, this one's for you. Try turning on the AC while your car is still plugged into the charger. It will help extend the vehicle's range when you get on the road, which means less money spent on gas. If you're driving one of the newer model cars, your engine must automatically stop when you idle your car. If that's not your case, avoid idling to save fuel. 
Waiting for the traffic lights to turn green takes 45 to 120 seconds. And starting your car requires only 10 seconds of gas. So, if you have to stop for more than 10 seconds, turn your vehicle off. If you let it run, it can eat up to an extra half a gallon of fuel per hour. Now, in case safety isn't one of your primary concerns, at least take good care of your car for reasons of economy. Check if your tires are well inflated at least once a month. When underinflated, they wear out quicker, drag, and waste gas. Check your car's manual to see how often you should tune up your engine. It depends on the age and model. Clean the filters to keep the car going while eating less gas. Use the right motor oil. Otherwise, your car will have to work harder than it should and waste gas. There's no need to play it cool and fill up with premium fuel unless you have a high-performance engine that really can't run on anything else. That will cost you much less in the long run and won't make your vehicle go faster, cleaner, or get better mileage. If your car's manual recommends but does not require premium, at least go with lower grades for extra savings. Gas chemistry has advanced over the past decades, so don't worry about the quality of regular gas. It's all good. If you have an older car, check out your gas cap seal. Once it weakens, it lets oxygen leak into the gas tank. When that happens, gas burns way faster. You can replace the gas cap, but be prepared that the sensors might not recognize the new one, unless it comes from the manufacturer or authorized supplier. If you have a manual transmission, you're in luck. You have complete control over your RPM. That's revolutions per minute. Lower gas means higher RPM. The higher the RPM, the more torque the engine produces and the more fuel it's using. So shift into the upper gears quickly. It differs from car to car, but an optimal solution would be to change to second by about 15 miles per hour and move to top gear by the time you're going at 30 to 35 miles per hour. That cargo container and the bike rack you have on the roof of your vehicle will have to go. They increase your car's wind resistance, so the engine must do more work to maintain the speed. It could mean up to 20% extra fuel consumption on the highway and up to 8% in the city. If you do need that extra storage, opt for rear-mounted cargo boxes. For those in car buying mode right now, look into a hybrid electric, plug-in hybrid electric, or all-electric one. I mean, you'll definitely cut gas costs with an electric car. Suppose you aren't ready for that much of a change. In that case, many popular models actually come in hybrid form. Toyota RAV4, Hyundai Sonata, and Volvo XC90 are all yours to go. And here comes the bonus tip that will help you cut driving costs by 100%. Are you ready for it? Don't drive! Okay, okay, let me explain. Don't drive whenever it's possible. Walk or bike to work or use public transport. If that's too much for you, at least swap driving responsibilities and gas costs with colleagues living in your area. Do you know any other tips to save gas? Maybe you have personal favorites. Do let me know in the comments below. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Now, a basic sponge and baking soda can make a great eraser for little grease spots, fingerprints, and stains on your walls, or many other painted areas such as furniture or wood fences. Just sprinkle a bit of baking soda on your dry sponge and scrub the stain area in a circular motion. And then use a clean, dry cloth to wipe the baking soda off to get rid of any remaining dirt. If you're worried that this technique might ruin the paint, Try just a bit of soda first and see how the surface reacts. If you want to extract the maximum amount of juice from your lemon or lime, put them first in a microwave for 15 seconds. After that, give them a little roll on a hard surface. And now, feel free to use your manual juicer. When you smash some glass or pottery on the floor, it can be pretty hard to notice and pick up all the tiny fragments, especially if the glass is transparent. Guess what can help you? A slice of bread! After you remove all the big pieces, carefully wipe a thick slice of bread across the floor to pick up any tiny fragments. They should just get stuck in the bread. 
but make sure to do this very carefully or just put on protective gloves. And don't absentmindedly make yourself a sandwich right afterwards. Hey, just saying. If you're a huge fan of garlic, here's a tip for you. Cut one garlic bulb in half and rub an empty bowl for a nice flavor. Now you can put your pasta, risotto, or salad in the bowl and enjoy your meal. Pringles tubes are made from a mixture of paper, plastic, and metal, which makes them a good option to organize groceries. You can paint the tubes in a plain color to make them match your stylish, minimalistic kitchen and then attach removable labels on the side. Have you ever struggled with threading a needle? Here's an easy way out. Place your toothbrush on the table and put the thread across the bristles of the brush. Now gently push the needle down over the top. The bristles will help you poke the thread up through the eye effortlessly. Once you got the loop, just use your fingers to pull it through. If you've got these annoying tea stains on your favorite mug that won't wash off, try to apply some toothpaste to your sponge. This is also applicable when you need to make your dirty cutlery shine. It's best to use a mildly abrasive sponge. It's pretty helpful when it comes to removing dark spots on dishes. Now let's say you've recently received a really gorgeous bouquet. But the flowers got this sad look in a blink of an eye. You can extend their living very easily and almost free of charge. First, fill the vase or vase with fresh water and put a couple of teaspoons of sugar. This will help to nourish the flowers. Before you put the flowers back into the vase, cut about an inch off the stem. But make sure to slice it at an angle like this. This trick will increase the surface of water absorption. Repeat this with all the stems, especially with hard ones. Now put the bouquet back into the vase or vase. The flowers should cheer up within 12 hours. If you suffer from cold feet, put them into a vase or vase. No, wait. Use a hairdryer to warm up your slippers before using them. This tip is also applicable to your outdoor winter shoes. Speaking of feet, phew, there's a great way to get rid of unpleasant smells. Apply about 10 drops of your favorite essential oil on two cotton balls. Now place the balls into the shoes and leave them overnight. Remove them in the morning and enjoy the fancy smell. You can also mix a couple of your favorite fragrances to customize your shoe fragrance even more. If your drain is a bit dirty and smelly, there's an epic tip to solve this issue. Put down a couple of spoonfuls of baking soda and pour down a little vinegar. And now step back and enjoy the show. It will foam up and help loosen any dirt. We've all tried to light a match outdoors in windy weather and failed. Well, we've been doing it all wrong. There's an easy way to prepare a matchstick in advance using a sharp knife. Carefully carve back the four corners just behind the head of the matchstick. Then repeat the same technique one more time so it looks like this. These eight little splinters will help create a stronger wind-resistant flame. If you have a small wardrobe with limited space for hanging new clothes, remove some metal pull tabs from the tops of old drinking cans. They can make the perfect holding loops for fixing the second hanger. Just put the ring over the hook. This is how you can double and even triple the storage space on one hanging rail. If you need to make an emergency candle, you can use one very common item from your fridge. Have you guessed what it is? Butter. Cut off a piece of chilled butter and place it on a heatproof dish. Poke a hole straight down through the center using a toothpick or a wooden stick. Now we need a wick. You can use a common cotton string or twine. Cut the corresponding length and poke it through the hole so it goes all the way to the bottom of your candle. Gently coat the end of the wick with butter and light up your brand new DIY candle. Use hair straightening tongs to smooth out those annoying creases on your tie. Or let's say you're working in a shop and you have to deal with fluffy piles of cash. The tongs will help you iron your money to put them in smaller stacks which then fit neatly into your backpack. Hey, let's not go there. Wow, this zipper is tough. Why can't it slide smoothly like all other zippers? But don't rush to throw away your coat. Grab a bar of soap and gently rub it up and down against the zipper. Repeat it on both sides. Can you feel the difference? Cut one leg off your old tights and put two long cardboard tubes inside it. Go ahead and thread it under your internal door with one tube on each side. This will protect you from any draft 
because the tights will seal up any gap under the floor. You can also use this trick when you need to make a full blackout in the room. Just make sure to use thick black tights. Let's say you're visiting a conference in another city, and your schedule will be very busy. You can prepare your outfits for each day in advance and put them into different compartments of your hanging clothes storage organizer this way. Now, put it right down into your suitcase, zip it, and you're ready to go! When you arrive at the hotel, you can just carefully pull out this organizer and hang it in the closet in just two seconds. But don't forget to take the shoes, too. Is there a way to drive a nail into a wall without hurting your fingers? The answer is yes. Grab your comb and push the nail in between the prongs. This way, you'll keep your fleshy fingers far away and safe. And once you've got it started, you can easily slide out the comb and finish driving the nail. If you need an emergency metal scrubby sponge to wash your pot or pan, use a piece of tin foil. Crumple it up into a ball, apply a little bit of dish soap, and your brand new sponge is ready. Now start scrubbing and get ready to be amazed! It works really well, huh? By the way, the tin foil doesn't have to be new. You can recycle the piece you've already used for cooking. And the final tip is for perfectionists. If your shower head has a hard water buildup, the water won't come out straight. To fix this, fill a plastic bag with plain white vinegar. Then put the shower head inside the bag, attach it with a band, and leave it overnight. In the morning, you can give your shower head a little scrub with an old toothbrush or clothes brush. This should help remove the remaining hard water dirt. This trick is also applicable for faucet heads. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. You park your car in a dark alley, lock it, and leave it for just a couple of minutes to go grab a coffee. When you come back, your beloved vehicle is no longer there. A siren sounds. Oh wait, that was the alarm. Phew! Luckily, that was all just a dream and you can help it to never come true. First of all, you can install a steering wheel lock in your car. It can either be a long metal rod stretched over the steering wheel or a chain lock connected to the seatbelt buckle. Both options are good to slow down the bad guys that might break into your vehicle. But don't make it 100% thief proof. The thieves can just cut the steering wheel or even the lock, so you need to add some extra layers of protection to be sure. Criminals like to use gadgets that catch signals and help them steal cars without a key. For example, if the car is parked in a garage of a private house or under the windows of a multi-story building, the keys are accessible through the radio device. Thieves can easily intercept the signal and the owners of the car won't notice anything. To protect your keys from relay attacks when they're stored at home, use something metallic. You can simply wrap the keys in foil to block the radio signals or keep them in a safe metal box. Park in areas that are well lit and have security cameras. Building entrances and parking lots are your best choice. An isolated garage isn't always the best idea because it could put you personally at risk. So if you do park in one of those, stay close to the attendant or where security cameras can see you. Keep the wheels turned towards the curb whenever you park. It will make it way harder for thieves to try to tow the auto with a tow truck. To steal a car, a criminal will have to make some extra maneuvers. It takes time and effort and can demotivate the bad guys. In many cases, it's not your car the bad guys are after. It's that shiny new laptop you dropped in the front seat or your designer purse that looks like it's stuffed with valuables. Things like that are hard to resist and often lead to a break-in. So take an extra moment to hide your belongings in the trunk, and your vehicle will be less tempting for criminals. Don't just jump out of the car, even if it's literally for a moment to buy something. If you need to get out, always stop the engine first, close the windows, and lock the doors. Storing your vehicle registration in the car is a good way to make the lives of thieves easier. They can present it to police officers in case they get pulled over. Your insurance information and VIN can help them get new keys to unlock the car no problem. 
If you aren't the only person using the car, find some secret place to hide the registration and only tell the people you trust 100% about it. You can also take a photo of your title registration and insurance information and store them on your smartphone. Another option is to make copies of those important docs and keep them with you. Mark your windshields, windows, and mirrors with a VIN number, which is the identification number of the vehicle. This service won't cost you a lot, but will demotivate the bad guys. They'll have to spend money to change the marked glass, and they will think twice if they want to invest in your vehicle. You can also play spy and leave marks on different parts of the car with an invisible pen or cover it in micro dots with your ID details. This won't stop thieves, but it will make it easier to track the vehicle if it gets stolen. If you know that you'll have to leave the car somewhere new and you don't feel like it's a safe place, hide an old switched on phone or tablet in it. Make sure you have a way to track it. Then, the Find My Phone feature will help you locate the phone and the car in a matter of seconds. You can either get a cheap data plan for real-time tracking or rely on GPS. It should work even without a SIM card. Protect your side mirrors from thieves with special covers. You can find models that come with locks made from anti-cut materials. The cover will also protect your side mirrors from scratches and scruffs and extend their lifespan. Plus, you can go creative and choose covers with your favorite team's logo or something else that's important to you. Not a bad idea to customize your vehicle on a budget, right? Car thieves use different schemes to distract your attention. A piece of paper stuck to the rear view window, a plastic bottle over the wheel, or a shirt on the trunk of your car. These and other small things will likely get you out of the car. The bad guys can also pretend to be nice and helpful and to tell you to pull over because there's something under your car. The idea here is, again, to get you out of your car and let them steal it. So instead of going out, close the windows, lock the car doors, and don't go out if there's someone suspicious hanging around. Criminals aren't the only bad guys who can do your vehicle harm. Harsh winter weather can be a problem too. If you don't want to find your wipers stuck to the windshield and scrape them off every morning, leave them up when you're not driving. You probably heard it's a bad idea because it ruins the arm spring and can tempt someone to steal your wipers. Don't worry, the springs don't lose their elasticity and there aren't really many people who are after your wiper blades. In case you forget to put the wipers up and find them safely stuck to your windshield, try running the AC. Cold air will defrost the windows just like warm air. It works by dehumidifying the air. If your lock is frozen and you can't get inside your own car, treat it with some hand sanitizer. That substance can melt the ice without a problem. To prevent your windshield from getting frosty, Mix three parts vinegar and one part water and spray that solution on the windows overnight. It'll save you some scraping time in the morning. Always keep your gas tank more than half full in cold weather. Moist air will be happy to fill any empty space above the fuel in your tank. And that air will condense to water in the cold. Water is denser than gasoline so it settles at the bottom of your tank. When enough of it accumulates, it'll go through the fuel line to the engine, and that's not really good. To protect your favorite car from rust, wash your vehicle regularly. Something as simple as that can be the difference because dirt damages the protective layer of clear coat and paint and makes it easier for rust to sneak in. Don't forget to wash the undercarriage of the car and the wheel wells. Make sure the car paint isn't chipping or peeling. You need that layer to protect your vehicle from the elements. In the cold season, salt from the road can also cause some rust spots. To avoid that, you should at least rinse the car every week, even in the winter. And don't forget to wax it at least twice a year. That's another good way to keep your paint looking good as new and protect it from UV rays. One more thing is to keep the inside of the car clean. 
If you spill something inside, always mop up the liquid. You don't want it to seep further and hit the metal parts. This is exactly how rust forms. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Here's how you can protect your bank card from potential fraudsters. Use a marker and cover the last four digits. You can also use a sticker that's easy to remove and place it over the security code. Have you had a house guest that didn't use a coaster? Get a hairdryer and hold it a couple of inches away from the stain. Blow it on medium heat for a couple of minutes to evaporate the watermark. If a faded ring remains, mix equal amounts of vinegar and olive oil in a bowl. Wipe it onto the marked area and rub it in until the stain disappears. Then wipe it off. Don't waste time scrubbing the burnt stains off the bottom of a pan. Instead, fill it with water and add three tablespoons of salt. Let it sit overnight as the salt dissolves the burnt marks. And in the morning, pour the water out of the pan. This way, it will be much easier to scrub all that grease off. Picture this. You're on vacation and your shirt has become all crinkled inside the luggage. You need it tonight, but the hotel doesn't have an iron. Don't panic. Hang the shirt up in the bathroom. And while you relax in a hot shower, the heat and moisture will unwrinkle your shirt. It won't be perfect, but it will get much better without any effort. The football is on, and it turns out you've run out of standard batteries. You can use a smaller battery instead that easily fits inside. Now take some aluminum foil and crunch it up. Fit it into the gap on the negative or flat end of the battery. All done! You can turn on the TV now. Once your flip-flops crack and the plug easily slips out of the hole, it's normally a sign that you need a new pair. But there's a way to extend their mileage. Push the plug back through the hole, then take a bread clip and attach it to the end. The clip will provide enough support for the plug to remain in place. You've received a package and the receipt is taped on. You've managed to detach it from the box. But how to separate the tape without ripping the paper? Hold both ends of the tape apart and by pulling it slowly, the tape stretches and separates itself from the paper without tearing it apart. Ziploc bags are perfect to keep things dry, but it would be great if they were larger. Take two and turn one of them inside out. They can now connect and work as one large bag, big enough to protect a keyboard. There's no need to carry your keys in your hand when you go for a jog. Instead, put them inside your pocket, take a rubber band, then tie it around the pocket from the inside. This stops the keys from falling out. You've broken your key in the door. It's stuck. Great. Arranging for a locksmith could cost up to $100, but for a cheaper and quicker option, try using a hot glue stick. Heat the end with a lighter, and once it's warm enough to melt, push the glue into the keyhole. The melted glue will enter the available space covering part of the key. Once it cools, it compresses and gains a strong hold of the key's end. Now, just pull it out. If you need to siphon liquid through a hose and want to avoid using your mouth, put one end in the liquid and hold the other upwards with your thumb closing the top. Now shake up and down. This jiggle motion pushes liquid upwards a little each time. And once it reaches the top, lower the exit point and let gravity do the rest. You've left your keys locked inside the car. It's an older model with a roll-down window. You could get the coat hanger and begin the long process of finding the lock. Or use duct tape. Make about 20 two-foot-long strands. Stick them onto the window, allowing enough room for the tape to grab onto at the bottom. Then with a friend, take the ends of the tape, holding them together, and pull downwards. The force will allow the window to lower enough that you can unlock the door. While drilling long screws into hardwood, your old drill might not have enough power, leaving them only halfway in. Before the drill gives up, get a block of wax and scrape the edges of the screws with it. The wax works like a lubricant, melting as it gets warm and providing easy entry for the screw. You're out camping, but you didn't bring anything to light the barbecue. Take a small plastic bag that won't leak. Fill it up with water and close it tight, making a round bubble. Hold it over where you want to catch the light from the sun. The bag of water will work like a magnifying glass, starting up the barbecue, just as long as it's a sunny day. Missing a corkscrew or a cork breaking halfway? By using a stove lighter, heat the top of the bottle. The heat slightly expands the glass, and this forces the cork out the top. You've superglued your fingers again. Take some salt and pour it on top of your stuck fingers. 
Put your fingers into the water and slowly rub. The mixture will dissolve the glue and release you in no time. While hanging up a painting, it can be impossible to find that stubborn nail. Place a fork upside down and insert it so the nail is in between the middle fork teeth. The fork has provided a long arm that's separated from the wall, making it easier to slip the string of the painting over the nail. Once it's perfectly balanced, simply remove the fork. You need to put a cake into a container, but taking it out again later by lifting it up from the inside might ruin the cake. Put the lid upside down and place the cake on the lid. The base of the container is now the lid, making it much easier to access slice by slice. Pour out water more efficiently from large jugs and bottles by swirling. This will make the liquid inside spin, creating a vortex. The vortex allows for the air to flow back into the bottle as the water pours out, much faster than the glugging alternative. There's an easier and less messy way to remove eggshells from a boiled egg. Once fully boiled, crack the shell on both ends by tapping them. On one end, pinch off the shell. Use the opened end to blow with your mouth. The force of air will push the flesh and expand the eggshell, forcing out the egg undamaged. When the hinges of your laptop break, repairing them can cost up to $300. A far cheaper fix is to buy a picture frame and tape it to the back of the screen. You've dropped a small piece of jewelry on the floor, seemingly impossible to find. Take a stocking and place it over the end of the vacuum hose. Give the area a good vacuum and check the end periodically. You will eventually find it sitting at the end. You've drilled a hole in the wall, but the drill hole is now too wide. Remove the screw and find an object that is slightly shorter and thinner. Pieces of plastic, small wires, paper clips, or even toothpicks are perfect. Place whichever item you find inside the hole. It's filled the gap enough so the screw will now re-enter securely. Taking the trash out can put you in a gross scenario of getting bin juice on you. A great way to avoid this is by placing old papers at the bottom of the bag. Now, not only does it absorb all the liquids from the food and other sources, but also helps prevent bad smells from forming within a bin. Nobody likes mosquitoes, and pesticides are pricey. A cheap alternative is to take a plastic bottle and cut the top part off from the bottom of the funnel. After removing it, turn it upside down and put it inside the bottle. Mix two cups of warm water with two tablespoons of sugar. The mosquitoes will be attracted to the formula inside and become trapped. Now just sit back and relax without getting bitten. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Okay, you're falling off a cliff. You somehow didn't know about her boyfriend. Dang, you're in a tight spot. Time to break the way down into several parts. Try grabbing anything you see as you plummet. Shrubs, trees, or rocks. This way, you divide a long fall into several short ones. With each new fall, the impact will decrease. If enough of the impact is absorbed, it means you've got a better chance of survival. And another chance at love. But not with her. Same for if you drop out a window. Try to cling to anything on your way. It probably won't hold you, but at least you'll have several falling intervals to help decrease your speed. A canopy to stop you can be a real lifesaver, no matter if it's plastic or glass. It'll hurt either way, but you'll survive. Maybe. You also need to bend your knees a little. If bent, your legs will touch the ground simultaneously, and the consequences will be less severe. Another tip is that whenever you land, try to do so on the tips of your toes and never on straight and locked legs. Don't forget to cover your head with your arms. They will help protect your noggin, no matter if you land on concrete or in a puddle of mud. Now, quicksand is not as dangerous as shown in movies. If you get stuck in quicksand, dang, you're in a tight spot. First off, stay calm. Then, you're not likely to sink more than up to your waist. Toss away anything that makes you heavier. Shoes, bags, even clothing. Wiggle your legs to create room for water. It'll help you get away. Your arms should always be up. Try floating, but not on your stomach. Move backward with small steps. Big steps are harder to take, so it'll take longer to get out. When you reach solid surface, roll out of that quicksand. 
Surviving a wild animal attack may be challenging, but a crowd of people is not any less dangerous. The crowd may move like a fluid, not letting you escape. If you're trapped between hundreds of people, dang, you're in a tight spot. Rule number one is not to stop. Stopping is the fastest way to fall. If you actually do fall, make an air pocket. Your arms should be placed above your face and chest, embracing them. If you manage to stay upright, as soon as you feel the surge coming, move with it and sideways at the same time. If you're lost in the wilderness and need to go fishing, you can use a can tab. Shape it in the form of a hook. Cut it at a slant and trim off the metal to make it look like an actual hook. The main thing is to create a sharp point. A can can also become a makeshift cooker. Take a can and cut out a hole from the side. Put some kindling inside and set it on fire. You can fry an egg on top of it. Dental floss can be super handy for surviving in the wilderness. First, use it as a fishing line together with a can tab hook. It can also serve as a clothesline stretched between two trees. It's thin, yet a single strand can hold up to 5 pounds. You can make a spear by binding a long stick and a knife together with dental floss. It's also quite flammable, so if you don't have any kindling to set larger pieces of wood on fire, try burning it. Dental floss can also be great makeshift shoelaces. A simple plastic bottle can make a very strong rope if you have a good knife. First, you need to find a small stump. It should have a diameter about the same as your bottle. Make a slit across the middle of the stump. Then cut a notch out of the stump large enough for your knife blade to fit inside. Cut off the bottleneck and make a small notch on its edge. Its width depends on the rope width you want. Place the edge of the bottle inside the center slit and put the knife in the notch in the stump with the blade towards the slit. Start slowly dragging the bottle through the slit. You'll see the bottle spin. As it spins, the blade will cut out the rope. You can use it to build a hut because it can secure logs really well. Now, a human can go several days without food, but there's no way we can survive without water. Water in the wild can be delicious sometimes, but if you feel like it's not safe to drink, you may need a makeshift water filter. Start with a fire. Boiling water may not be enough, so as soon as the fire ashes are cold, grind them to a powdery consistency. Don't use charcoal you randomly found in the forest. You never know what's in there. Then you need a plastic bottle. Cut off the bottom and make a hole in the cap. Turn it upside down, put in some charcoal, 3 inches are enough, and pour the water over it. The dripping water is ready to drink. To catch any excess charcoal, wrap the cap with a piece of clean cloth for extra filtration. Okay, you're getting hungry and you probably need to start a fire. Dang, you just don't have any matches or a lighter. Empty your pockets to see if you can make a makeshift fire starter. If you have a battery, probably the one from your flashlight, and a gum wrapper, that's enough. You need to cut a thin strip of the foil wrapper, yet long enough to connect the two ends of the battery. The middle of the strip should be slimmer than the ends. Get closer to the pile of dry grass, small logs, or even some paper, whatever you're going to use to start your fire. The foil strip will ignite in seconds, setting the kindling on fire. Mosquitoes are a real pain, and there are loads of them in the woods. You can make your own DIY repellent to keep those bad guys away. All you need is an orange, a lemon, or any other citrus fruit that's full of essential oils. Peel an orange and rub the peel directly on your skin, crumpling it a bit beforehand to make those precious essential oils come out. One more useful way of keeping mosquitoes at bay is to add a few orange peels to your tinder. While burning, the essential oils will release and frighten those pesky guys away. If you want to send a signal that you're lost and it's an emergency, cover three small fires with any green vegetation, like grass, and then cover it again with some wet fabric. You'll have big white smoke puffs. Three puffs in a row means emergency. Adding some oil to your fire will turn the smoke black. If you don't have oil, use birch bark instead. Remember, the higher you start the fire, the better. So climb to a visible area. If someone has your hands tied together, dang, you're in a tight spot. 
The first thing to do is move your wrist to loosen that tie. Ropes can usually be cut through with friction against hard and sharp objects. If you're tied up with a zip tie, try to break it. Clench your fists, press the knuckles together, raise your hands above your head, and then bring them down sharply. The pressure will snap the tie. You may also try to slip out of the zip-tied knot. First, clench your fists. The wrists will go larger, like this, widening the bonds. When you relax your hands, the bonds loosen, so you may slip out. Duct tape can be chewed through, or if you moisten it, it will turn softer and easy to loosen. You can even moisten it with your saliva. Crossing a water current may be more dangerous than it seems. When crossing, choose a straight and wide section. Before stepping into the water, check if the current's not too fast. Throw a stick in it, and if it moves faster than your average walking pace, consider crossing at a different location. Or you could just look around for a boat that's nearby. No need to be silly about it. What can survive in space? Well, people can, if they have an excellent spacesuit. Spacesuits are, shall we say, kind of a needed item in the vacuum of space. Without one, you'll have to stay inside the spaceship or modular dwelling on the Moon or Mars. Currently, NASA has only several older spacesuits ready for use outside the spacecraft, like the International Space Station. NASA's Artemis mission to the Moon is planning to have new suits designed for both men and women. It has a quarter-billion-dollar budget for them. These new suits are much less bulky than the older ones and much more fashionable. But what other creatures besides people can live in space? Three named animals were sent into space, and they all came home safely. Does that qualify? Two dogs, Belka and Strelka, spent a day inside a Russian spacecraft in 1960 and became media stars upon their return. The USA launched a chimp named Ham on a 16-minute ride into space. Space starts 62 miles above the ocean level and only takes a rocket a few minutes to get there. Ham, who wore a spacesuit, performed all his button-pushing tasks admirably and is honored in the International Space Hall of Fame in Alamogordo, New Mexico. But tardigrades can actually live in space. Tardigrades, or water bears as they are often called, are brown and look like teeny tiny grizzly bears and are one of the most miniature animals with legs. They have eight of them. Most species of tardigrades have no eyes, but some do. It's possible to see water bears with a good magnifying glass, since they average about a half millimeter in size. Sprinkle a little water on moss, and they'll come out. They can walk about one body length per second and run at about two body lengths per second. Water bear eggs are easier to spot because they're bright white. The European Space Agency took water bears to the International Space Station and left them outside for 10 days. They survived. They still survive with no air, water, almost a perfect vacuum, harmful solar radiation, extreme cold, and heat. Well, that doesn't sound very fun, does it? In extreme conditions, water bears rely on their exoskeleton, or tun, to protect themselves. In laboratory tests, this exoskeleton could withstand immense pressure at over 87,000 pounds per square inch. That's quite a spacesuit they got. Water bears have even been frozen solid for 30 years. And when warmed up, the water bears revived and were still able to reproduce. As we search for life in space, as we explore Mars, these types of extreme life forms become essential to understand. If water bears can survive literally every environmental condition, can we conclude that life is everywhere in space? Extremophiles are life forms living in extreme conditions, such as other planets might have. Movile Cave in the country of Romania is one such place that could just well be on another planet. All life on Earth, on the surface of the Earth, is carbon-based. It means that carbon atoms act much like a universal Lego block, to which hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen atoms connect to form the molecules that the cells of living organisms are made of. But not in Movile Cave. Movile Cave was sealed off at least 2.5 million years ago. The water that percolates up through limestone rock has formed a lake in the cave, a mix of hydrogen sulfide, poisonous and corrosive, and ammonia. What could live in this toxic soup? Well, sulfur-based life forms. An entire ecological system without light or photosynthesis exists inside Movile Cave. The food chain is built on chemosynthesis. 
microorganisms eating sulfur-based chemicals. 33 species of sulfur-based creatures were found living in the hostile environment of Mulville Cave. Shrimp, scorpions, centipedes, snails, etc., etc. Mulville Cave is an alien world deep underground full of sulfur-based life forms. If creatures like this exist in Mulville Cave on Earth, what can we expect to find living in outer space? Bacteria! Bacteria can live in outer space, and fungi too. Bacteria form the base of the food chain, and bacteria have been proven to be able to live in outer space. In the 1980s, cosmonauts on the Mir space station complained that something was growing outside the station's windows and blocking their view of Earth. It turned out, upon inspection, to be bacteria and fungus, or fungi. The windows, made of quartz, were being damaged and weakened by what was growing on the surface. Fungi were also found to be eating copper on some of the cables. Mold was found growing in some places on the outside of Mir. The space station was under attack by microorganisms. Scientists took this very seriously and began to investigate. It seems that in a sterile environment such as space, bacteria come out of their hiding places when no other microorganisms are around. Cosmic radiation may even help them mutate and adapt to the space environment. The bacteria seem to be growing even faster in space than on Earth. Years later, the United States decided to run a bacterial experiment on the International Space Station. They coated rocks with various bacteria and put them outside the space station. Some bacteria did not survive the harsh conditions of space, but many did. One strain called OU-20 survived for over a year and a half outside the ISS. Japan also did a bacterial experiment on the International Space Station. Outside the Japanese Kibo module, Kibo's robotic arm placed three panels with the bacteria Dinococcus radiodurans, or D radiodurans for short. It survived outside in space for three years. The lead scientists of the Japanese experiment calculated that the bacteria could live as long as eight years in space. That's long enough to make a journey to Mars and back four times. Now, this raises a couple of interesting questions. Could life have come to Earth from Mars in a space rock? And, more pointedly, could an infectious bacteria come to Earth in a space rock? Suddenly, what had only been considered in science fiction books and movies was now a subject of intense scientific scrutiny. And then came the Mars meteor. Antarctica is the best place to find meteors because it's covered by ice. The ice in the Allen Hills regions of Antarctica is locked in place by the configuration of the surrounding mountain. The ice here sublimes. That means the ice evaporates, never becoming liquid but turning directly into vapor. As the ice in the Allen Hills region sublimes, it exposes all the meteors that have hit the ice over many hundreds or thousands of years. Meteor hunters literally drive around on snowmobiles and pick them up with tongs, never touching them to avoid contaminating them with human bacteria. They bag the meteors, number them, and record the location and any other pertinent facts about the meteor. That's how meteor ALH84001 was found, the Mars meteor. Since Earth gets hit by about 17 meteors every day, over thousands of years the numbers add up. Almost everywhere has been hit by a meteor at one time or another. 11 years apart, two houses on the same street in Weathersfield, Connecticut, had their roofs punctured by one-pound meteors. But only a rare few meteors ever come from Mars. 126 meteors have now been identified as coming from the red planet. ALH 84001 came from Mars. Scientists know this because the United States has landed on Mars and sampled Martian rocks and the Martian atmosphere composition. ALH 84001 contained the same gases as Mars' atmosphere and similar chemical composition as the rocks. But the meteor also contained something else, a fossilized life form. There has been much debate about whether or not the tiny object inside ALH 84001 is a fossilized bacteria life form or rather a chemical deposit. But the studies aboard the International Space Station confirm that bacteria can live for a long duration in space. So it is entirely possible that some bacteria could make the journey to Earth from Mars in a meteor. The United States Mars Exploring Perseverance rover has recently found organic molecules inside Mars rocks. These organics are carbon and hydrogen. 
It won't be known if these organic molecules were produced by living organisms or merely by chemical reactions until the samples are returned to Earth sometime before 2030. The search for life on Mars is ongoing. But Mars is not the only place in the solar system that might have life. Jupiter's moon Europa is a good suspect, too. Entirely covered by miles of thick water ice, Europa may have an ocean of salty water beneath its icy crust. Ice acts as an insulation blanket. Combined with possible internal thermal processes in Europa's core means that Europa's ocean water could be warm. The Europa Clipper Express mission plans to confirm conditions for life on Europa. Loaded with nine pieces of observational equipment, the Europa Clipper will attempt to observe just about everything possibly going on by orbiting above Europa, including the chemical composition of the mysterious reddish-colored material that has ejected onto the surface ice from the ocean below. What could this reddish material be? Could it be a specific chemical mix? Or could it be krill, shrimp? fish, life forms like in Moveo Cave, or the ancient remnants of a bright side narrator. Hmm, stay tuned. Ready for this? You will not be able to leave the confines of a bath of any type for an entire month. And you will be provided with food and drink that your friends will take turns to deliver. You'll be able to constantly adjust the water temperature whenever you like, so that the water won't get too cold. You're getting excited, and you're confident that you'll earn quite a bundle of cash, equating to several hundred dollars when you last the entire month. It's the bet you made with your friends only a short time ago from within your simple fishing village where you were sitting with your friends at a bar. Little did you know that it would lead to this from a simple conversation. You had been discussing the evolution of mankind, and the conversation mainly focused on the potential that humans could have moved towards evolving to water-based mammals, potentially becoming mer-people. The facts are all in evolution, you tried stating to your friends. Your friends weren't convinced, even with your example regarding getting wrinkly fingers from being in the water for too long, an evolutionary trait we humans adapted to ensure we have grip whilst fishing with our hands in water. Of course, your friends don't see how this could relate to the possible evolution towards becoming a mer person. You felt the need to prove them all wrong. As your friends sat around enjoying themselves, moving on from the conversation of aquatic evolution, you thought hard. How can I prove them wrong? Then it came to you. You stood up, finger pointing to the sky, and said, I bet I can stay in a bathtub for an entire month. And here you are now following the arrangements you seem to have doubts about. Knowing about particular human evolution reignites confidence and understanding in you that there have been some instances in human history where people have adapted naturally to live with their sea-based lives. So this feels like a safe bet. For example, the sea nomads in Southeast Asia have been fishing for 1,000 years in their unique way. Diving deep into the water to catch their fish armed with just a spear these sea nomads have adapted to grow larger over the centuries. It allowed more oxygen cells to be pumped through vital organs and more oxygen to be stored for their deep water dives. This understanding gives you confidence as you await the first day of the bet. During the first few hours, you seem fine. In fact, you find it to be easy and joke throughout the first day, bragging how this will be the easiest money you'd win and what you plan to buy with it all. You sleep well through the first night, but little do you know that your skin absorbs the water in the bathtub as you sleep. With each passing hour, more water enters your skin. Between the two layers, water bubbles form, creating visible lumps on the outer layer of your skin. As you awake the following day, you're slightly alarmed to see the transformation of your skin. You look over your hands, they are all white, with the skin crumbling away, and your arms are covered with large lumps of liquid. It's not a pretty sight. You hear someone coming into the bathroom, and you try to calm yourself down. It's only the first day, after all. You just need to toughen up. You need to win this bet, not only for the money, but also for argument's sake. Your friend enters the bathroom with a tray of food, and your friend's facial expression soon turns pale as they see the lumps on your arms. Concerned, they ask if you're okay, and surprisingly, you do feel just fine, and respond that you're just a bit itchy. You're pretty curious how there's no pain, given the sight of your arms. 
Without thinking, you begin to scratch the large bubbles on your arms. You continue to rub your arm to see the skin's reaction. You now have a freeing feeling as your arms are exposed, as though you have removed unnecessary weight. You find yourself with a new layer of scales in place of skin. Your friend requests that the bet must end, given the sudden change to your appearance. You argue that you're okay and that you want to continue. There's just too much at stake, and you want to win this bet desperately. As your friend accepts this and leaves, you request an upgrade to a jacuzzi. You're soon upgraded to the jacuzzi, and by now, not only do your friends come to visit you, but members of the village visit curiously, as events like this don't stay secret long in such a small, simple village. As days go by, more scales appear in place of your skin, covering your legs, arms, and your lower back. Your skin is still visible throughout most of your body, but the scales are spreading quickly, similar to a rash. It doesn't take long before you get tired of the jacuzzi and your friends are happy to support an upgrade to the village's swimming pool next to the seaside. You're now in the final week of the bet, and by now, the entire village knows about you, the merman. What you find to be incredible, though, is that as the people visit you in the pool, there's no fear or judgment. The people are just overjoyed and intrigued at the spectacle of it all. The pool is large, but it isn't heated. A teenager asks you whether you're warm enough, but you don't notice the cold at all and feel pretty comfortable. Your diet has now changed significantly. You prefer primarily fish. Webbing has grown between your fingers and toes, and small slits on both sides of your ribs have opened, forming gills to allow you to breathe underwater. As you continue to evolve, you keep trying to reassure yourself that it's just a little longer and that winning this bet was all that mattered. You think back to almost a month ago when you and your friends placed down your bets, thinking of the cash. Oh, several hundred dollars. It'll all be worth it soon. And besides, you could always devolve back to normal. This will only be temporary, surely. The final day of the bet finally arrives. A great party has been arranged to celebrate your victory. The entire village attends the celebration. There's a band and a great feast for all to eat. You enjoy yourself with the villagers, preferring to stay in the pool, of course. Teenagers throw fish to you, and you catch the fish in your mouth, laughing at your own expense. You jump into the air, performing tricks to the villagers who applaud with every trick. As the party goes on, you slowly break away from the celebration, watching on by yourself in your pool. You feel yourself growing tired of the festivities and the attention. You look on as the villagers laugh and party. You think you're somewhat out of place swimming alone within this simple village. You feel a sudden urge to leave, and you no longer care about the celebration. You have no interest in the money from the bet. You're not bothered that you proved everyone wrong. You only feel the desire to be free. You swim to the edge of the pool. It's dark, so no one can see your attempt to escape. As you pull yourself out, the weight of your body out of the water is so heavy and your legs and arms are so weak that you collapse and have to crawl very slowly towards the beach. Eventually, you make it to the edge of the shallows and you collapse as you make it to the water out of breath. The small saltwater waves you feel splashing on your face reinvigorate you after your exhausting journey. Once you've gathered enough energy, you begin to swim towards deeper water. And like a fish to water, you swim with ease. The feeling you have now, swimming in the sea, is like you had been in a cage all of your life. Now you're finally free. The exhilarating feeling of the water with unlimited space seems like heaven to you. As you swim further into the sea, you stop suddenly to look back at the village for just a moment. You pause and watch the town that was once all you knew and you listen to the muffled sounds in the distance, reflecting on the life you had within the village. You feel no emotions as you look back, with no regrets or remorse. And then you dive underwater, ready to begin your new life under the sea. Well, you finally made it. After all that training, you're ready for your first skydive. Full of confidence, you reach the door of the plane as it gets to 12,000 feet. You step off into the air, but at the last second, you hear the instructor screaming something. Sorry, I didn't check your shoe. Well, you can't hear him as you drop away from the plane, seeing only his concerned expression. Well, feels like something has gone wrong. 
You pull the handle to release the parachute, but it hasn't deployed correctly, opening into a big wad, and you're now spinning faster and faster. You're getting dizzy, but you need to pull yourself together. Each second is crucial, and from this altitude, you have less than a minute to act. You throw yourself into the Bowman formation, spreading your body out with your arms and legs forming a big X. This creates a little more drag, allowing you to stabilize a bit. Hey, this whole thing is a drag. Now you have more time to get to your emergency reserve chute. Still dizzy from spinning, you try to remember where it is. You grab what you think is the right strap and pull it hard. Oh no, that's a leg strap! You've loosened the container on your back, and now you're slipping out! This is not your lucky day. You hold on and tighten up the leg strap. Oh yeah, the safety procedure is coming back to you now. Hmm, step one, cut away from the main parachute with the red handle. Done! Now you're in free fall again. Step two, now find the silver ripcord handle to pop the reserve chute. Gotta hurry, the ground is rushing up at you. Where's that handle? Whoops, there it is, sitting on your chest on the left. You yank it hard. Cut a thump! The chute flies out and deploys and slams the brake on your descent. Now you're relieved. Breathtaking? Heart pounding? Oh yeah! Finally, you can enjoy the view. For about 10 seconds before you land on the ground. Softly. Feet first. Hey, looks like fun. Sign me up. On another day, as always, instead of taking the stairs, you use the elevator. Now, the odds of it falling are 1 in 10 million. You're 10 times more likely to be hit by lightning. But today, you're in that unlucky elevator. As you move down from the fifth floor, the pulley system fails, a cable snaps, and the elevator starts falling. Quickly, you lie down on your back, placing one arm around your head to protect it from the impact, and the other arm over your face to save it from possible falling objects. You spread your legs out evenly. In just a couple of seconds, you brace for impact. It crashes down, and debris from above falls around you. Fantastic job! You've avoided injury! But could it be possible to alter the impact by jumping? Well, let's think this through. If you jump too early, your impact would be more severe as your speed would increase in the descent. And if you jump too late, the velocity of your jump upwards would cause you to bump your head as the elevator would have stopped. You need to jump at the precise moment to be effective in velocity. And without the ability to see through steel, it would be down to sheer luck. So it's better to use the lie-down method. Yeah, good luck with that. You casually drive to work, passing over the same bridge as any other day. Today, there's more traffic than normal, and you're stuck in a jam. The bridge starts to creak. Unfortunately, it's possible for structurally faulty bridges to collapse under excess weight. And there you are. As the bridge falls into the river, your car floats on top. The water is slowly rising around you as it starts to sink. You're trying to remain calm and take a deep breath. You have up to two minutes before the car completely sinks. You need to act fast and roll down the window. As you take off your seatbelt, you notice the water has risen above the windows. You try to roll them down, but they're stuck in place from the pressure. You've missed your opportunity. You're sinking further down and thinking about opening the door. Hmm, better not. This will make your vehicle sink even faster. Plus, it'll be more dangerous to exit. The car hits bottom, and the water is slowly entering it. You try to open the door, but the pressure is so intense that it won't budge. You think about the water coming in. Maybe if you waited until there's enough water inside, it could regulate the pressure, allowing the doors to open. But with the limited air that would remain, and if the doors still don't work, that's too much of a risk. Your only choice is to smash the window. You can do it easily due to the water pressure, and it spills in quickly. You take your last deep breath while holding on to the window frame. The car fills in quickly, and the suction suddenly stops. You pull yourself through the window and place your feet on the car, push upwards, and swim to the surface. Yeah, remind me not to carpool with you. Next, you're out hiking in a forest and find the perfect place to view the sunset. You take a photo, and it looks great. But wait, which way is it back to camp? It's getting dark and you have no idea how you got here. You check your phone. It has a map, so you'll be fine, right? Well, you've taken way too many nature pics, and the battery has run out. You can survive up to three hours without shelter in harsh weather. 
You can go without water for three days, and up to three weeks without food. You need to address your next actions in order of importance. So your first task is to build a shelter. You lean a large stick onto a tree for the roof support. Then you build two walls on the sides, making a sturdy frame. There are plenty of leaves in the forest, and you cover the roof with heaps of them for insulation and protection. On the inside, you build a nice leafy mattress. You enter and wait until morning, hoping to have a relaxing sleep. Well, you've slept horribly, but there's no time to leave a review on your booking app. The next task is finding water. You follow a clear decline in the land, eventually finding a stream. Clean water? Check. You continue to walk with the stream's flow, hoping it leads you to a river. You are more likely to find people and signs of civilization along large collections of water. Hours pass, and your belly grumbles. You look around for tasty snacks. There are berries and mushrooms, but you don't recognize them. So it's better not to eat something if you're unsure whether it's poisonous. You search under old logs and branches for bugs. You've found some mealworms that can be eaten raw. Some insects, when cooked, can be a major source of iron, protein, and vitamin B12. You look at them, and your appetite goes away. Hmm, maybe later. Finally, the stream connects to a river, and just ahead of that, a bridge. Not the one that fell down. Well, the struggle is over. You throw the bugs away and begin the next adventure finding a diner. Yeah, we're not going camping together either. Next, you're walking in a field. The wind is picking up, and not far away, a tornado is forming. You start running away from it, but you can't outrun it as it travels up to 60 miles per hour. Your main concern isn't the tornado itself, but the trees and buildings that the twister takes in, turning them into dangerous flying objects. They fly at crazy speeds as they're carried by fast winds, reaching up to 300 miles per hour. You look for shelter, but there's nothing available. Your only possibility is a ditch that's not surrounded by trees or other breakable objects. You lie wedged in a ditch and cover your head with your jacket, holding it down with your arms for protection. While lying flat, with that thundering noise around you, you feel like you're in a giant jet engine. It's a terrifying sound. But luckily, you're not in the tornado's pathway. You can hear the small debris whistling over your head, and many make an impact, thudding all around you. But thankfully, they miss. Suddenly, everything goes calm. You lie there controlling your breathing, trying to relax. You don't get up, not yet, as the worst may be yet to come. Tornadoes can last from several seconds to up to an hour. You're not taking your chances and remain in your ditch for the full hour. But finally, when it's clear that it's gone, you dust off your jacket and head home. Meanwhile, you're really bad luck, so I'm removing you from my contacts and unfriending you on social media. And I'll do that once I get out of the hospital. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. You're flying over the Pacific Ocean when suddenly a storm hits the plane, causing it to shake. The aircraft begins to descend, and you lose control. You quickly put on a parachute, eject yourself from the plane, and land on an island. It's a good thing you were the only one on the plane transporting some goods overseas. Luckily enough, the storm hasn't damaged your parachute. You unstrap yourself and head to the closest shelter under some palm trees. You're waiting for the storm to be over. The next day... The sun is shining, and the waves seem nice and friendly. You wake up and look around. Nothing but a large stretch of water encircling you from all directions. Not a boat, human, or another living being is around. You scout the island, trying to find anything. You don't even know what you're looking for. On one side of the small island, you see some scrap metal and remnants of the plane washed ashore. You rush over there and try to see if there's anything useful. Too bad everything is destroyed. However, one sealed box has made it. You open it and see dozens of duct tape rolls piled on top of each other. After going through the island, you head back to your camp, dragging the box of duct tape. You try to figure out what to do. Soon, you get a light bulb moment. There are some places on the island that are hard to access, 
and since your shoes have been damaged, you fashion out some sandals. To do it, you grab some branches and try to use duct tape to make a new pair of shoes. After many failed attempts, you almost give up. But then, you attach some duct tape to pieces of tree bark that are roughly the size of your foot. Those are going to be the soles of your new shoes. The duct tape is smooth and won't hurt your feet. After adding several branches, you wrap the duct tape around your feet and voila! You have duct tape sandals. Now you can venture into the rocky parts of the island without damaging your feet. As you walk along the island, you start feeling the heat. You wrap your shirt around your head, but it's not enough to protect you. You use some duct tape to create a hat with the help of leaves. Then you place it on your head. You're now safe to go. After a while, you bring back some stuff you found around the island. By this time, you've started to feel that your tummy is rumbling. Next, at a rocky reef, you spot some large yummy crabs and fish, but you can't catch them with your bare hands. You grab a long branch, take some palm tree leaves, and tie everything together to make a net. You then use the duct tape to reinforce it and head to the reef. You're wearing your makeshift sandals and the hat to protect your head and carrying the net to catch some fish. So far, you've only used two rolls of duct tape. After a while, you manage to catch some fish and crabs and take them back to the camp. You make a fire and start grilling your catch. You're sitting on a log, but such a seat isn't too comfortable. You take some duct tape and make a mat for yourself. Once the food is ready, you feast on it. Now another problem, water. There's no fresh water around, but a storm is coming. Meanwhile, you take some coconuts and eat dessert while drinking coconut milk to freshen up. You prepare a small hut by gathering branches and leaves and duct taping them together so that water can't seep into your new home. At the same time, you create a funnel out of duct tape to collect rainwater. After getting into the funnel, the water is collected in a makeshift pond, also made out of duct tape. At this point, you've used almost half of the duct tape rolls. The storm starts brewing and you stay inside your hut where you have your new floor mat. You're bored, so you create a chair and table out of duct tape to make the hut a little comfier. It starts raining and you notice that some water has gathered in the reservoir you built. You immediately drink it using a coconut shell as a glass. Your hut manages to withstand the storm and you catch some Z's on your comfy mat. The next day, you check the duct tape supply and see that you are now halfway to finishing your last roll of tape. You've made a secured and solid hut and have a steady food supply from the reef. You've already spent five days on the island, so now it's time to find a way out. You've tried your best to seek help, but nothing. Not a plane or ship in sight. You're desperate to get out, and you're lucky. You spot a cargo ship very far off in the distance. You need to act quickly. After reviewing your box of duct tape, you decide to create a raft to sail away. You gather enough food and water for the journey and get to work. You start by collecting large logs for a base and setting them side by side. You have some rope made from tree bark and leaves to tie the logs together. It's big enough to fit you. You then get another set of logs and place them on top of the base and repeat the same process to create a second layer. This way, you minimize the risk of sinking. In the end, you duct tape all weak spots to reinforce your raft. You use some branches to create oars for rowing with paddles made out of duct tape. You see that you've used around 75% of your supply, including the tape you use to construct the hut and furniture. It's not as strong as fresh duct tape, but it still does the job. After the base and oars are finished, you create a small hut to shelter your food and supplies and protect them from waves. 
Also, you make a mast out of wood and use a piece of cloth as a sail. You put the raft on the water and begin rowing. So far, so good. You open the sail and take a break from rowing. You turn around and take a look at the island that has been your home for the past five days. You're going on a dangerous journey, risking it all. But if you remain on the island for too long, then you definitely won't make it. It's been an hour already, and the island is barely visible. But the ship is getting closer. You still have one more roll of duct tape to use in emergency situations. The waters are calm, and you see dolphins swimming around. You snack on some fish and drink some water before noticing that the waves have gotten larger. You prepare your sail and duck for cover. It's a good thing your raft is sturdy. Large waves crash against it, knocking off some of your food and water. But the raft is still in one piece. As time passes, the sun begins to set, and there's still no sign of life. You use the rest of the duct tape to repair the raft. Even though you lost some food during the storm, you have your net to catch more fish. You start a small and safe bonfire in a coconut shell, cook the fish, and start eating. You turn around and spot a ship coming your way. You immediately grab a branch, light it, and start waving it for the ship to see you. It looks like it will miss you. But then, someone on the ship notices you. They drop down an emergency boat to pick you up and rescue you. It's safe to say that duct tape has truly saved your life. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. You can turn ordinary matches into waterproof ones. Apply a thin coat of nail polish to the matches and let it dry. Once they're ready, they'll stay dry enough to start a fire even if you drop the matches in the water. If you get lost somewhere during the winter and need a drink, then don't eat snow. It has much more air than water, so you won't even feel much more hydrated. Your body also wastes a lot of energy trying to eat it. Even worse, you might lower your body temperature and could even get sick. If you find yourself face-to-face -face with a coyote or a wolf, don't turn your back. Slowly retreat while facing the animal. This might only work for a single animal, though. If you meet a pack, then the most important thing is to make sure that they don't surround you. Back away towards a tree and press your back against it. Then choose the right moment and climb it as quickly as possible. Several layers of clothing will warm you better than one warm fur coat or down jacket. Air will be trapped between the clothing layers, insulating you and keeping your body warm. If you get lost in the woods, always try to sleep a little above the ground. You can lay on a layer of branches and leaves as a makeshift bed, or stretch a hammock out between some trees. At night, the temperature drops and the ground becomes cold. Even if you build a fire, it could go out while you sleep, and the ground will be sapping your body heat. You're in a boat in the middle of the sea, no food, no fishing net, and you're hungry. It was supposed to be only a 3-hour tour. Well, guess what? You can catch fish with the help of shoelaces and any object – phone, watch, or keys. The shadow cast by the boat in the sea can attract fish, and a reflective object can work as bait. Tie your keys to your shoelaces and use them as a fishing rod. Even if a fish doesn't bite, activities like this are a good way to maintain a healthy mind on the open sea. A short meditation can save you from a panic attack. You need to focus on your breathing and try to slow it down. Your brain will quickly calm down and turn its focus away from the panic. Oxygen masks in airplanes work on the same principle. When you control your breathing, your attention is redirected away from whatever bad thing is happening. You can make a torch out of a log. Put a small log vertically, make a deep star-shaped cut on the top, put dry grass leaves and sticks inside. Once you're done, set fire to the log and watch it burn for up to 3 hours. This should work the same regardless of the size and type of wood. Now, if you meet an angry grizzly bear, never try to run away because the bear can easily outrun you. Instead, lie down and don't move. Grizzlies only usually attack when they see a threat, so they'll often leave you alone if you show them that you won't cause them any problems. 
This only works with grizzly bears, though. If a confrontation is unavoidable, back away slowly and use bear spray. If you don't have any, pepper spray will work similarly and should disorient the bear and scare it away. Or not. Don't eat berries or mushrooms in the forest if you don't know exactly what they are. They could be poisonous. If you have no other option, eat the inner bark of maples, birches, and pines to fill your stomach. Use a knife to cut away the rough outer bark and get to the softer white stuff. You can boil it to make it even softer, or cook it over an open fire to make a crunchy snack. And if you're really starving, you can look for ants. They might not be the most appetizing, but they're pretty nutritious. If you don't have a watch, you can use your fingers to find out how much time is left until sunset. Raise your hand so the inside of your palm is facing you. Your fingers should be between the sun and the horizon line. See how many fingers can fit in this space. The thickness of one finger equals about 15 minutes, so you can calculate the time left before sunset. If you're lost and need to build a fire to attract attention, throw in a lot of pine, cedar branches, cones, and any unnecessary rubber objects. Your fire will emit more black smoke, which makes it visible from afar. If you have no water in the desert but have some food, try to avoid eating for as long as you can. The more you eat, the more thirsty you'll get. The body needs liquid to digest food, so it'll use up what little you have. A person can live much longer without food than without water, so don't be afraid to stay hungry. Hey, you found a huge puddle of dirty water in the forest. If you're desperate for a drink, you can fill your bottle and filter it into drinking water. To clean it, make a rope of gauze or clothing. Put one end into the dirty bottle and the other one into the empty one. Before long, the clean water will flow into the empty bottle through the rope while the impurities are left behind. Before hiking, replace your regular shoelaces with paracord shoelaces. If you don't have enough rope, these laces can give you a few extra feet in a pinch. If you're lost in the forest and have nothing to warm you, then take dry leaves and grass from the ground and put it between two layers of clothing. This will help you stay warm for a long time. When you're lost in the desert, try to move as little as possible during the day. Find a shadow or create it from improvised materials and sit in the shade until dark. At night, you'll spend much less energy and use up less fluid while you walk. This will help you to avoid the risk of a heat stroke. If you fall through some ice, don't try to get out like you would in a pool. If you put your hands on the ice and try to push yourself out with your arms, it could crack and make you fall back into the water. You need to stretch your arms parallel to the ice surface and stretch your legs way back so they float in the water. In this horizontal position, start waving your legs as if you're swimming. Move your arms carefully without putting too much weight on the ice, and you should be able to escape. If you need to build a fire while it's too windy, here's what to do. Dig two holes next to each other and create a small underground tunnel between them. Make a fire in one of the pits. The wind can't extinguish it, and the fire gets its air through the second pit. This method is also useful if you need to build a fire without drawing attention. In the dark, this kind of fire won't be visible. Don't throw away or pop bubble wrap. Take it on a hike with you. It will protect you from the cold better than even a thick blanket would. Those tiny air bubbles are perfect insulation. Just put it in between layers of clothing, and it'll stop any warmth from escaping. The plastic it's made of is also waterproof, so it can stop you from getting wet, too. Swimming in the sea, not far from the shore, you can easily get swept up in rip currents. If this happens, the most important thing to remember is not to swim against the current. This will only waste your strength and sap your energy, and you're unlikely to ever overpower an ocean current. Instead, try to swim sideways along the shore. Sooner or later, you should get out of the current, and then you can safely swim to the beach. If you're stuck in a falling elevator, don't try to jump at the moment of collision. Don't take a sitting position or stand either. You need to lie on the floor, facing the ceiling. Spread your legs as wide as possible, cover your face with one hand, and put the other hand behind your head for protection. You reduce the pressure on your body in this position when you fall. Ooh, you're lost! 
a rescue helicopter flies over the forest, but you don't have a flare and don't have time to build a fire. Use a small mirror or phone screen to reflect the sunlight. Aim the light beam towards the helicopter. Rescuers should notice the glare and fly over to save you. You're up to your neck in cold water. There's ice all around you. You've got to get out! When you're swimming in freezing cold water, your body can get a bit of a shock. Your reflexes might make you want to gasp, but don't. Just do your best to keep your head above water. Throw off any heavy objects like boots, jackets, or backpacks. When you reach some ice, don't just try and jump out. It's not exactly a swimming pool. Try to get into a horizontal position and use your strong legs to swim onto the ice. Use your hands to pull you out. Once you're on the surface, roll away from the edge, then crawl, then walk. If you're venturing into the wild, you may want to get some stuff ready beforehand. Make your own fire starter at home. Heat up some water in a pan, put a Pyrex container in there, and melt some paraffin wax inside it. Then take an egg carton and put some dryer lint in each section. Fill them with paraffin. Wait till it's all solid and cut out each little section. Just one of these little guys will make starting a fire way easier. Dental floss can be super handy for surviving in the wild. You can use it as fishing line with a can tab as a hook. Or you can use it as a clothesline. Just stretch it between two trees. It looks kind of flimsy, but a single strand can hold up to 5 pounds. It's also quite flammable, so if you're having trouble starting a fire, you can use a few feet of floss to start it up. You can make a seriously strong rope using a simple plastic bottle, if you have a good pair of scissors. Cut off the neck of the bottle so it looks like a tall and narrow cup. Then, start cutting it like some people peel an orange, round and round in a spiral. Try to keep it the same thickness the whole time. It'll be a lot longer and stronger than you're expecting. You can use it to tie sticks together to make a hut. Or you can wrap it around your backpack in case it rips or something. Sugar might be damaging for your teeth, but it's got a pretty sweet superpower. Just pour some on a piece of cloth and use it like a band-aid. Aw, oh, delicious! Mosquitoes can be a real pain, and there are loads of them around. You can make your own DIY repellent to keep those little guys away. All you need is an orange, a lemon, or any other citrus fruit. They're full of essential oils that mosquitoes can't stand. Peel an orange and rub the peel directly on your skin. Just make sure to crumple it a bit beforehand to help those precious essential oils come out. Another good way to keep the mosquitoes at bay is to add a bit of orange peel to your campfire. That releases the essential oils into the air. You're getting hungry, but you don't have anything to start a fire with. Empty your pockets. There might be something in there that you can use as a makeshift fire starter. If you have a battery and a metal chewing gum wrapper, you're in business. Cut a thin strip of the wrapper, long enough to connect the two sides of the battery. The middle of the strip should be thinner than the ends. Grab some dry grass, twigs, or even some paper, whatever you're going to use to start your fire. The foil strip should ignite right away, so make sure you're ready. A human can go surprisingly long without food, but not water. Depends where you are, but a lot of the time, it might not be safe to drink. You can make a DIY water filter. Start with a fire. Boiling the water may not be enough, so as soon as those ashes are cool, grind them into a powder. Don't just use any ash you randomly found in the forest. It might have some melted plastic on it or something. Then, you need a plastic bottle. Cut off the bottom and poke a small hole in the cap. Turn it upside down. Put about 3 inches of charcoal in and pour the boiled water in nice and slowly. The drips are ready to drink. If you're getting bits of ash in the water, wrap a piece of clean cloth around the cap for some extra filtration. A char cloth can come in handy if you're lost in the wild. To make it, you're going to need a metal container with a cover. Put a piece of cloth inside it and put the container into a fire for a few minutes. The cloth should end up getting a bit black around the edges, but still be intact. A char cloth catches fire super fast, even with an old school flint. If you're ever hiking in an anaconda's backyard, listen up. 
stay away from shallow rivers because these giant snakes love to hang out there. If an anaconda decides to give you a little squeeze, don't exhale. Every time you do, the snake's gonna squeeze you a little bit tighter. Anacondas do have a weak spot though. They don't like their tail to be bitten. It's not exactly delicious, but it'll get the job done. Avalanches are pretty powerful, so remember these tips next time you're out on the slopes if things get a bit hairy. First off, cover your mouth, use a scarf for some other piece of cloth, and don't let the snow in. Keep one arm straight above your head, and don't forget to dig out a little pocket in front of your face. That'll let you breathe for about a half hour. Get rid of anything heavy you're carrying, even if it's expensive. But make sure you hold onto your backpack. It's an extra layer of protection. And grab onto a tree if you see any. To get back to the surface, move like you're swimming straight up. Snow's just water anyway. If you ever somehow get trapped in a sinking car, don't panic and don't try to open the door. The water pressure from the outside will be too strong. You'll just waste valuable energy and that door just won't open. The best way to escape is through the windows. Roll them down and swim away. If you're not a great swimmer, you can try to create your own makeshift flotation device, like a plastic bag with air trapped inside. Tie a knot in it and make sure it's tight. A plastic bottle would work great, but one probably won't be enough. You can also use a raincoat or a pair of those waterproof pants. You can even use an upside down trash can. If you have some car trouble at night, out in the woods for example, you need light to see what you're doing. All you need is a bottle of water or a jug, or even a pickle jar filled with water. Just strap it on a headlight and voila, the water will spread the light so you can see better. Perfect for setting up an emergency tent or finding wood for a fire. Mason jars, those pickle ones, are really handy when it comes to storing matches. If you're camping in a forest, it's really important to hide those matches away, somewhere dry and safe. To make it even more convenient, make a strikeable lid. Cut off the strips on the side of your matchboxes and glue them to the lid of your mason jar. Before your next big outdoor adventure, make sure you're all stocked up on dark chocolate. Chocolate is probably the most delicious survival food, but it's also one of the best. It's loaded with calories and helps keep your mood up. Plus, you don't need a fork, plate, or fire to prepare it. Last one for today, people. Still having trouble lighting that fire? Look no further than that bag of chips you secretly hid from your fellow campers. Corn-based chips are everywhere these days. And apart from tasting delicious and turning your fingers a weird color, they have one more trick up their sleeve. You can use them to start a fire. These kind of chips are flammable, so make a little mound of chips and keep that dry wood handy. They'll light in seconds. Now, when you need help in public, don't ask a group of people. Instead, approach individuals. Because of something called the bystander's effect, the group of people may not help you. This social psychology theory states that people are less likely to help you when others are around them. They assume someone else from the group will run to your rescue. If you're driving in the city or another area with a grid-like design and think you're being followed, turn right or left four times. You'll end up at the same place you were before, and if the car behind you does too, you're probably being followed. Don't go home and try to lose them. If you're outdoors while a storm is approaching and your hair stands up, find shelter immediately. Static in your hair means positive charges are rising through your body, reaching toward the storm's negative charges. You're likely to be struck by lightning. If a shelter isn't available, squat low on the ground on the balls of your feet, put your hands on your knees and your head between them. Making yourself as small as possible will minimize the contact with the ground and the damage from the lightning. Always carry a small mirror with you while traveling in isolated areas. It'll come in handy if you get lost. If you're stranded in the desert and a plane flies overhead, point the mirror toward it to reflect the light. If you don't have a mirror, signal planes overhead by waving both your arms up and down. 
If you're stranded somewhere in your car, don't abandon it. It's more challenging for rescuers to spot you without your vehicle. Unlike what's shown on TV, when someone's about to drown, they won't wave or cry out. They'll have their head tilted back, submerged in water. They'll attempt to keep their mouth above the surface by using their arms. When you see someone looking like they're floating or bobbing, trying to get their head out of the water by trying to climb onto the surface of the water, they need help. If you can't swim and you've fallen in deep water, don't panic. Hold your breath and let yourself bob up to the surface. Keep your back and legs straight. Try performing little kicks to bring your body back to the surface. If you're trying to save someone who can't swim, never approach them directly. They'll likely bring you down in their panic. Sneak up on them from behind, slip your arm across their chest, and make sure their hands aren't facing you. If they grab you, they can pull you under. Try to swim below them, come back a bit further away, and try to help them again. If you come across a grizzly bear, it's not your day. Now, don't run and don't make eye contact. Slowly walk away if it isn't close to you. But if it's charging, stand still, you can't outrun it. Speak in a clear, monotone voice and don't scream. Now, prior to this, you might want to research to see if there are grizzly bears where you're traveling and take pepper or bear spray with you. If a bear is within 25 feet of you, then use the spray. If it attacks you, curl up in a ball and lie on the ground. Stay quiet, don't move or panic till it goes away. Now, if a polar bear is chasing, but it's far away, start dropping clothing items, a hat, scarf, or a shirt, and run away. Polar bears have short attention spans, and they may stop to sniff your clothing. This will give you time to head to safety. By the way, if both of these bear encounters happen to you, then please remind me not to go on vacation with you. Moving on, if someone is choking but they're coughing, don't intervene. (laughs) Coughing means air can get both in and out, and they've got a partial obstruction in their airway. By helping, you could cause a backflow of air, which could either force out the hazard or dislodge the blockage and cause a full block. Just let them cough it out. Only help when they can't breathe or cough. When caught in a strong rip current, never swim against it. You'll tire yourself and it won't end well. Swim parallel to the shore fast, but stay calm and comfortable. Even if you get further out, you'll eventually escape the current and can head back to shore. Thumbs are the weakest part of someone's grip. If someone pulls you by the wrist, don't twist your arms in their hand. Try to push away, starting right where their thumbs are. Notify your State Department if you're going abroad. In the U.S. and some other Western countries, you can tell the Department of State that you're going overseas. In the event of a natural disaster or a political conflict, they'll know that you need to be evacuated. They'll also update you on things that happen in the country you're visiting to protect you from trouble. If you find yourself in a stampede of people, you're in trouble as soon as you fall. Don't curl up in a ball and wait for it to be over. This can cause more damage. Try to grab someone's leg as they run past you to help yourself up and keep going. Sometimes, camping trips end with people lost. If you're in such a situation and trying to walk out of the camping site, take burned coal or wood sticks with you. Use them to draw messages on trees, rocks, or logs. The markings will stay there for weeks, and it'll be easier for the rescue party to trace you. Always carry a needle in your first aid kit. If you're lost, you can make a compass with one. You first need to magnetize the needle by rubbing the eye against hair, fur, or silk around 100 times. Fill a container with water, place a leaf on the water surface, and rest your needle on the leaf. It should start pointing north to south. When calling emergency services, first tell them your exact location and then the problem. Even if you get cut off, they'll know where to send the police or an ambulance. If you have a fishy smell in your home, call a licensed electrician immediately. It can come from overheated plastic and electrical components that can cause an electrical fire. It might be from an outlet, a switch, an electrical breaker, or something else. Like the fish you're baking in the oven. If a snake bites you, there are a few ways to tell if it was venomous. You can ask. It probably won't tell you. 
Venom snakes usually have multiple colors and cat-like pupils. Look at the bite area. If there are two deep puncture wounds, you were most likely attacked by a venomous snake. If the bite mark has tiny sharp teeth and a U-shape, it was probably non-venomous. Whatever the case, call emergency services and snap a picture of the snake if you can. Using your mouth to pull the venom out is even more dangerous. You've got more chances of getting poison than removing the toxin from your body. If you're traveling and exposed to freezing temperatures, you're at risk for frostbite. At first, a part of your body will become hard and pale. Then you'll experience aching, stinging, and numbness. To avoid frostbite, apply petroleum jelly on your nose, ears, and the tips of your fingers and toes. You uh, did remember to bring some, didn't you? This brings up a reminder. If you're shivering while in the cold, you're safe. Your body is trying to warm you up by contracting your muscles. But once you stop shivering, and if you grow tired and want to sleep, then find a warm place immediately. You're at risk for hypothermia. You'll need a warm compress on your chest, neck, or lower tummy. Never apply a warm compress to your hands or legs. The sudden temperature change could force cold blood back into your heart, lungs, or brain, causing your core body temperature to drop. If you're lost and you need to drink water from a stagnant source, always boil it to purify it. Untreated water has bacteria or other oils and chemicals that can be harmful to you. The exact temperature and time you need to boil the water depend on the altitude. To be on the safe side, try to boil the water for 3 minutes. When cooking oils start to boil, they'll smoke and then catch fire. If that happens, turn off the heat and don't remove the cooking pot. Cover it with a metal lid. Fire won't survive without an oxygen source. Use baking soda to extinguish small grease fires. You'll need a ton of it to do the job. And only use this tip when the fire is small. Never use water. It'll cause the oil to splash and